Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Crypto is like the financial system, but different. It doesn't care where you come from, what you look like, your credit score or your outrageous food delivery habits. Crypto is finance for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Visit kraken.com slash see what crypto can be to learn more. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc. View PVI's disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. Achtung, achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and James Holland. You, you've been um, uh, living the dream, haven't you? Walking the ground. Yeah, I've been walking the ground. Um, and uh, I came up with so many... Um so many phrases that that Tom, who was who was on the trip, came up with a with a, a Sicily we have ways bingo card. Yes, I saw that. Um, and one of the big ones, yeah. one of the big revelations, yeah. was from from Mike Chalky Peters. Mm. Chalky Chalky doesn't like anyone calling a a, a, a wacko um, glider a Waco. Oh yeah, he's really, he's got a real thing about that. So like, don't it call is. it a don't call it a Waco. It's a wacko. Yeah, you see, he says that. Oh, well, you know, you can argue that. Over, you it's can just, argue it's that with him, Chalky. It? It's just him. It's just Chalky's the only person I've ever heard them heard call them uh, wackos. The, the only, the only person. I mean, I'm I'm happy to happy to hear his reasoning, but it, that, it, well, I can't quite remember what it was, but it was quite solid when, oh, when he when he explained it. What is it? An acronym or something? It's an acronym. Yeah, it's an acronym. And the reason it's not Waco Waco is a town in Texas where yeah, I know David that. Koresh, yeah. But um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But 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 it's got nothing to do with that. They're designed by the Waco. They're designed by the Waco Air, WACO Aircraft Company. Yeah, but the WAAC obviously stands for something. I can't remember what it is. So the the Waco <laughs> Aircraft Company, the Weaver Aircraft Company. That's I've, it. I've I've gone to Wikipedia inevitably. Founded in 1920, dis- defunct in 1947. WACO referring to the aircraft is usually pronounced Waco, like the first syllable pronounced as in water. Not Waco, like Waco, Texas, whose name is entirely unrelated. So Waco. So it's not so Waco, Waco either. So Chalky's wrong. I like can't water. Wait. Oh, that's can't good. Wait. Oh, looking forward to that one. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Brilliant. So yeah, so we had that anyway. That was all good. And the difference. He was very interesting on all that because he was talking about the different ways in which which because obviously we you know we, we went to Ponte Grande, which was which was the ill fated glider attempt on on the first night where only four out of one hundred and forty seven landed and sixty nine landed in the sea fifty four went haywell and whole ten were I mean, never accounted for after that saying all. yeah we'll try that again <laughs> that's just amazing it's, but anyway he was so saying that, that is completely amazing that they tried it again so so check that I, I know we said this before but it, it, it it's worth repeating the average flying time on yeah. walkers. Oh, no. <laughs> an hour and a half at night and three hours by day. That's what they had, the pilots. Yeah, I know. It's, I know. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. But anyway, he was saying that the, 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 the Warco, oh, God, yeah. I'm enjoying oh, this. I can't do it. Yeah, good. It's a <laughs> the Warco. The Warco. It's designed to kind of, because it's alum, aluminum, aluminum. Um, uh, rather than wood, it, and it's this completely different shape, it's designed to kind of sort of effectively flutter down. He said, so imagine a kind of like a, a, a sycamore bud. Yeah. You know, hovering down and just fluttering down, so it flutters down. Whereas the whole point about the horse is it's supposed to go down in a very deep, steep yeah, swoop, dive, swoops in, yeah. swoop down and swoop in. So it's it's not that one's right and one's wrong. It's just that the horse is designed to do what it's designed to do, and the walko is also designed to do what it's designed to do. But but they're fundamentally two different things. And the aim of the Ponte Grande operation is to do what it what wants to do in a horse. Yeah, and that's what the and that's what the British pilots are generally trained on if they've trained on anything. Yeah, glider pilot, GPR guys. Oh dear man! I know, it's just so so mad. It's so yeah. mad. And obviously, we went to sort of Capo Muro de Porco, where the uh, where where Paddy Main's SAS lot landed. And you know, you are just thinking, wouldn't it have been better to just put these guys ashore by boat? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. What really is the point of this? Yeah, but one thing I did do, which which we hadn't, which I hadn't been to before, which was really good, is we followed the advance of the first infantry division. On Highway One Twenty, I think it was up in the up in the north, 
you know, from, from so so it's going from it's going to Spalinga, then Nicosia, and then on to um, Cheremi, and then on to Troina. So it's that that west to east axis. But you know, obviously, I hadn't been to that part of the ground before, and it was fascinating to see it. It was yeah. really, really interesting. So um, really interesting. So how many were in your party? About thirty-five. Most right. of them, a, a large proportion. I see a couple cool. of Americans. Yeah. Handful of, of Canadians. You said there was a, a Canadian there who accompanied Centre on Holiday or something. Yes, Sudana. Yes, yes. She 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 been on holiday. Basically, she's she works in a, a law firm. She's obviously been working too hard, and so her her um her colleagues at the law firm said, right, you're going on holiday. Um, we insist you take a break. Here's your holiday, and it was a place for two on this tour because she they knew that she listened to. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, she was. They, so she took her sister. He didn't know really anything about the Second World War, but 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 sort of entered into the spirit of it. Oh, but they live in Halifax in Nova Scotia, mm-hmm. so they were talking all about Halifax and the war. So and HTPs like and, and everything, yeah, yeah. Wow! That's and then, then we got one one evening. We had one evening we had such funny conversation about fainting goats, as you do. It kind of one of those conversations that just sort of expanded <laughs> and went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> and, some, and this American girl, Isabel, was saying, so, 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 "Yeah, you know, we used to have fainting, fainting, fainting goats on our farm." I was like, "What are you talking about?" Apparently, there's a whole sort of breed of goats that when they get scared, they just fall over. Really. Yeah, so then, yeah, then you kind of look on TikTok and Instagram. And there and they all are. It's literally, yeah, it's literally the fainting thing. goats. It was, it was, it was great fun, and um, everyone was utterly delightful and entered into the spirit of me and sitting. They walk, walk miles to Highland Division monuments or um, up, but it's not called Azoro. It's called Asoro. I've now discovered. So that's another thing I got wrong. So Warcos, Warcos is just so brilliant. Can't wait to get chalky on that. It's Warcos. That's what it's it says. It, as yeah, in that's water. Really funny. That's really, really yeah, good. That's really yeah. funny. So, so it was good, you know, and, and you always learn more. And, and um, you know, I was reminded again of just how completely grim it is operating and must have been if operating in Sicily. Yeah. Really, really horrid. Yeah. And, and, and the weather's, that's the good weather, isn't it? That's the thing. It's not the, it's not the bad weather that follows that winter that, you know, Savage Storm is all about. The particularly bad winter of 1943, 44. Um, oh, it's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Especially um, bad. Especially, especially bad. bad. <laughs> Um, so did you, you so what yeah, order did you do it in did you did you you know start in so we did, we did the Americans first we went to Jella Tom as in bingo card had a copy of Rally Trevelyan's Guide to Sicily which had obviously oh, written just after war and um he was pointing out that 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 Jella was a was a place senza speranza, you know, yeah. without any hope whatsoever, and one of one of the biggest dumps on the planet. And so, so I was sort of going, well, I know it's our first stand, but you know, don't be put off by that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so we went and stood on the beach where where you know the famous picture of Patton is standing yeah. on the beach and stuff, and and had a look at all that and working into the town, and um, then we went out and had a look at it from the Italian point of view, from the um, from the counterattack across the plain yeah. of Jella, and I mean yeah. literally like walking, you know, getting out of the Somme trenches and walking across open no man's land i thought that i mean, I mean you sent a photo of that i thought it was absolutely extraordinary that that that, that yeah that, I mean, what were they thinking zero cover so what are you thinking no cover i mean no cover at all i mean what's your only your only option is rolling barrages and all sort of old yeah fashion. so the rolling barrages don't turn up with a few mortars that's it because yeah. the artillery's not tied in with the italians yeah. of course yeah um and it's a complete cock up and so basically in the in the in the morning in full daylight under the eyes of, of offshore naval guns and um, blocking positions on the roads of americans with 30 calibers and mortars and all the rest of it which they'd prepared overnight because the americans yeah. are trained to operate at night not yeah just by daylight, yeah, and they get absolutely slaughtered, which of course yeah. they're going to. Um, yeah. It's always absolutely inevitable. Uh, supposed to be a coordinated attack with the with the Germans, but the Germans, the Hermann Goering division, who just moved there two days earlier, and yeah. don't know the ground whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that really struck home was the absurd, the utter absurdity of having Tiger tanks in Sicily. Yeah. I mean, just just utterly pointless. Yeah. I mean, just can't do anything. Yeah, I mean, because the first the first first three Tiger tanks, the first one. They get hit as they turn around a corner by by an American paratrooper with a small anti tank gun, thirty seven yeah. millimeter or whatever they've yeah. somehow got with them, um, and that gets hit. So the driver then panics because he's crap and yeah. doesn't hasn't very well trained. Or or, or, only, off or, the or alternately only human. Or only human. Yeah, to be fair. <laughs> to be fair. But 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 you know, man for man, he's not one of those ones who's been on the Eastern Front, been in Poland, been yeah, in the yeah, Balkans, yeah. seen there, done it. Okay, so this is yeah. this is a new boy. Panics, gets stuck. So another tiger up behind him comes up and tries to haul him out. In the process of hauling him out, breaks its steering gear. So a third one comes along to get both of them out, also breaks its steering gear. So three tigers are knocked out, blocking the road, can't go anywhere. I mean, yeah. 
just utterly ridiculous. So that was, it was quite interesting going there. And then we went to this amazing place, which is the Casa, um, Casa de Priolo, which is Piano de Lupo, which is a sort of high plane of the wolf, yeah. which is where they're supposed to, the 505th are supposed to be landing and yeah. only a couple hundred do. But there's this this strong point, this Italian strong point around this villa with bunkers and, and trenches mm. and stuff around it on this kind of mild promontory, um, maybe a mile and a half north of, of, the, um, of the Piano de Lupo, edge of the Piano de Lupo. And we went there, and you, you still go to this house. It's absolutely covered in bullet holes and spang and all the rest of it. Yeah. And, and so I was taking the people through this, through this house, this sort of ruined villa, which basically hasn't been rebuilt or touched since yeah. the end of the war. Yeah. Where there was this really, really substantial fight, and you know, a handful of you know twenty five paratroopers from the eighty second from, from from the first battalion, A company, in the first battalion, managed to overwhelm this, this Italian position, yeah. nick fifty thousand rounds of machine gun ammunition, twenty five. Machine, Italian machine guns, all yep. set up roadblocks, blah, blah, blah. And the stink was absolutely dreadful. I couldn't work out where it was coming from. Then we found there was a dead dog in the front room. Oh! Yeah. Oh, my God. It'd obviously gone in, like, laying down to breathe its last and, you know, gone to a deeper, the deepest sleep of all. And there it was. It was just left there. The whole place was completely high. But weirdly atmospheric. Right. Extraordinary. But all a bit grim. Yeah, but uh, and then we went to the we went to the Canadian invasion beaches. That was good fun. Yeah, and um, and saw where we are. And you could absolutely marry up Farley Mowat's account, Alex yeah. Campbell's account yeah. from his letters and yeah. the war diary. Yeah. Suddenly, it all made sense. And this is the one where the commandos come from the other side of the spur. Yeah, and, and meet them. And it was really good. And there were the dunes. You know, you could see where the wire had been. There was a the high ground, which wasn't very high, but significant mm. enough and all mm. that kind of stuff. So it was, always, it was really good. The terrain is sort of um, incredibly challenging. Did, did you get anything new from this trip? Yeah, I think so. I think, I've, I think I sort of doubled down on the uselessness of the Tigers. Uh, and yeah. I doubled down on, on just the sort of how bonkers these, these attacks were. So yeah. we went to the Headley Verity place, but I went to a slightly different place where I went before. And you just see this huge area. And I, I kind of, sort of looked at the original map from 1943, where it yeah. says, no cover. Uh, and <laughs> there isn't. And at least they're trying to do it at night under some kind of, you know, the cover of darkness and the cover yeah. of a barrage. Yeah. But the Italians, you know, the, the 34th Infantry advancing over the plain of Jello is, mm. is just insane one yeah. thing you can't deny though is you cannot deny the the courage of the italians yeah you can deny the uselessness of their their tactics and lack of coordination and all that kind of stuff but but you know hats off that takes unbelievable balls to be able well, to walk well, over and open ground being absolutely hammered but this is it isn't it you know yes it's stupid but it's also got that um this is what the word gallantry is for isn't it yeah, I've always thought that the word gallant gallant gets wheeled out, where basically someone insists on a load of people doing something absolutely terrible that will get them yeah. killed, and they do it. Yeah, it was fascinating. The whole thing was fascinating, and I kept saying, "So, are you getting are you getting a, a sort of sense of this location, a sense of the kind of the space?" And they were going, "Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, loud and clear." I'm sort of feeling I was having, having a sort of dodgy winter moment, you know. Where it was kind of- <laughs> Slightly sort of over over overselling my my pitch, but um, but but yeah, no, it was amazing. It was amazing, and I've I've also been thinking the Germans at Salerno and mm. and Kesselring and the abandoning of Apulia, yeah, in September, yeah, and 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 abandoning the Foggia airfields, yeah, and of course it's it's because he throws all his eggs in one basket, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, Every, everything is thrown at getting rid of Salerno. It's a really bad defeat for the Germans. Yeah, yeah. because. They've chucked everything at it and it's failed. Yeah, and uh, well, and the and, consequences are. But the, but the Allies getting ashore is a defeat for the Germans. Full stop, isn't it? Mm. This is this is the point. You know, you you don't need to. You don't really need. To, it, it's like the idea that they don't all achieve all their objectives on D Day. No, they get ashore. They get ashore. They get a hundred thousand men ashore. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, one hundred fifty-three thousand. Yeah. Exactly. That's 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 the objective. You know, like. Yep. Con, whatever you know, the, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Getting ashore is the point. That's the victory. That's the thing the Germans absolutely need to make sure doesn't happen, and they fail. But, and 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 it's the same at Salerno. They don't dislodge the, and even Anzio, you know, that 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 the, they don't dislodge it. They don't they dislodge don't. it, and the and, and the consequences of that. So Gasparini has his eight divisions in southern Italy. Yeah. So he's got he's got two thirds of a division yeah. left in Apulia in the yeah, southeast. Yeah. He's yeah. got one division guarding Rome, and all the rest are thrown at Salerno. The consequences of doing everything at Salerno means you have to abandon the southeast of what? What did I mean? What of, of, of Italy? What did Kessering know about Allied strength um, for Avalanche, though? What What was his apprehension of 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 what you know? Did he Did he think Did he think 
I'm throwing everything at it because because this will solve the problem, or was he thinking I'm throwing everything at it because this is everything that I've got? Well, I think I think what he's thinking is is that what I can do is I can I can throw the allies out at Salerno, and then I can turn back to deal with the allies in Apulia by by chucking everything at Salerno and failing. You've then lost. You've hundred percent lost Salerno, uh, lost uh, Apulia and the Foggia airfields, rather than possibly losing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. losing that. Yeah. And and, and and not contesting the landings at Taranto, which which would have been a um, right. Well, that's all part of the kind of abandonment exactly, of Apulia. I mean, exactly, you know, it's, but, it's, it's but, just it's but, such but, an but, error. But he doesn't even bother contesting those landings, which which no. just seems so peculiar. Because that that's when you, you you know that's when you're at your most vulnerable is when you're between ship and shore. And because all his all his so he's got twenty nine pounds of going a deer in the southwest. Yep, doing demolitions as eight farming moves up. Yeah. He's got third Panzer Grenadier, second pa- um, Faustum Jaeger around Rome. Yeah, he's got Hermann Göring and fifteenth Panzer Grenadier, sort of between Rome and and Naples. Yeah, he's got twenty sixth Panzer, kind of sort of hovering around. Yeah, and he's got first Faustum Jaeger in the southeast, and he's got sixteenth Panzer at yeah at, at Salerno already. Elements of Faust, first Faustum Jaeger are left to do demolitions and minor, minor, minor rear, rear guards on the in the southeast. Yeah, you know Apulia and confronting the landings at Taranto. Yeah, second Faustum Jaeger is left to look after Rome, and everything else is held at held at Salerno. It is an ideal landscape, though, for that kind of demolition, slow, granular retreat thing, though, isn't it? Because yes, you, you know, you've lots of bridges, you've lots of roads cut into mountain sides and all that sort of thing. So if you're if you're thinking essentially. I can't do everything all at once because that's Castlerigg's problem. Is he can't do everything all, all at once. He's he's not got the people he needs to be able to to deal with all the basically all the problems the allies are creating for him. So he's got to he's got to pick, hasn't he? Pick, literally pick his battle in this instance, hasn't he? Yes. So he decides to go all out to kind of defeat yeah. Salerno, but he doesn't. Yeah, I know. I know. Despite having yeah. superior numbers, yeah, they don't have superior firepower, but they do have superior numbers, and, and it doesn't work. Well, they're defending, th- but there's the word firepower. There's the thing. Um, uh, uh, at the uh, at this stage, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in, the, in the, the stage of putting people ashore, allied advantages in firepower are absolute, aren't they? And and deliver, particularly because you've got naval gunnery at your disposal. It's when you it's when you're off the beach and grinding your way up through through Italy itself that that advantage starts to sort of nullify itself, doesn't it? He didn't have to do that. What he could have done is. Retreated slowly up the leg. No, that's my point. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. So you, what you Demol- do is you demolishing is you, is everything. You you, you 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 demolish everything, and you fight the battle when you're not having to deal with naval gunnery. And and then you go to Normandy the next year, and the Germans draw themselves into a an uneven struggle because of naval gunnery that they insist on exposing themselves to. Again, again. Will they never learn these people? But what you've got here is the Germans definitely not learning, and the Allies thinking. Well, if we can, if we can get them to loiter on, within range of our, of our uh, naval yeah. gunnery, we're laughing. WNTL, yeah, yeah, you know, which is why six airborne have have naval foos with them, yeah, parachuting in with them because that's 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 who's going to do your he- heavy lifting. He knows he can't get on the phone to Hitler and say, "Well, what we're going to do is withdraw and shorten our lines and get ourselves." It'll be he'll have. It'll be Hitler, Hitler on the telex machine or whatever they've got going. Push them back into the ocean immediately, isn't? Won't it? Yeah, so, but I don't think he's got on the blur that morning going. You have got to shove him back. I think he just says, you know, I think that's 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 Kesselring kind of responding to it. But hmm. but anyway, it, yeah, it's fascinating. You've been doing lots of Arnhem stuff. Oh though, haven't you? my god! So okay, so, um, so, I'm, so enough enough Italy. We're you know enough Italy. Well, should we on. take a quick break and then we'll come back? We'll yeah, come then we'll come back to Arnhem. I want okay. I'm tick your medical man. Fascinating. Ah uh, yeah 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 yeah. Okay, uh, we'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to Way of Ways of Make You Talk. We've mopped up Jim's Sicilian trip. Thoughts on Kessering? Um, well, Kessering. just one last point on the Sicilian trip, which links to which which links to your um, to Arnhem, is that um, you know I was talking to a lot of the, a lot of the guys about you know, it came up in conversation what you were doing next and all the rest of it. So I mentioned it, and 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 actually Paul Davis mentioned it completely out of the blue. He just said, "Oh God, I really love the sign of Owls' new book. It's just fantastic." Well. <laughs> You know, uh, so, so, so there pressure. is enthusiasm for that. No, uh, that's no good. No, well, I've been well, but, but I've good been, I've, I've been. I mean, one of the 
basic things I've been doing is I've, I've, I've um, and we talked about this um, last time, I think, as I've been going through the Cornelius Ryan archive. And, and what's interesting about that is a lot of the accounts in there, are, you know, are people who also published books and memoirs and stuff. So, so this is, you can sort of cross reference and see the, which the extent to which things have maybe changed and in it with further reflection or sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. What you get relentlessly and you get it from, what what I really like about this is 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 he's always said you know we were dying to go because we kept being we kept being g'd up for operations brief for operations and then they got cancelled to the point where the seaborne tail um uh, first airborne division has a seaborne tail with scores of jeeps in it and trucks and the you know third line supplies and all this sort of stuff and the the REOC component of uh, of the of the division and the RESC component so the ammunition and supply side of thing the logistics side of thing absolutely um fascinating they set sail for france on the 15th of august for an operation that is then cancelled so they're already out there they've, they've gone they're already out there they've gone they, they, they're told they're ordered to they're ordered by first airborne hq to set off go to the port of london they yep. uh, embark they come off uh, the mulberry at juno they find an orchard to sort of park in um in normandy and they hang around and and basically Second Army are going, well, who, who, who the fucking hell are you? Like, why are you here? Right? Because one of the really, I think one of the really interesting things about, and you, and, and, and as you, when you start to look at, and Seb Ritchie's very good on, about this, about how 21st Army Group, you know, first Allied Airborne Army, by the time Arnhem is six weeks old, so it hasn't actually organised itself yet, right? It isn't really properly organised. You've got different people in different roles all. Because it's a brand new thing and they just haven't bedded down. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. it's and it's 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 That's a really it's, good point, actually. It's all post but it's all post fillets where basically there's you know, there's a reorganization where yeah. where um you know Eisenhower Eisenhower takes over, sets himself mm-hmm. up in Europe, comes over, takes over, Monty's promoted but but yeah. demoted. That you know, the, all these things are all happening at once. And first Allied Airborne Army is a big part of this. And the Americans get the get the key jobs. Br- yes, Browning is is in charge of um what we do when we get on the ground, but he is not in charge of what of how we get there, which is, after all, the critical piece of the jigsaw. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, but basically, Seb Seb Ritchie argues, twenty first Army Group. They, they they're not talking to um, first Allied, Allied Airborne Army. There's a there's a you know lack of understanding of what, what of what the Airborne Army might offer, how they do things, what they do. And twenty first Army Group, we're obviously. They've had they've had months since D Day of of doing things their way, evolving, learning, churning, changing since yep. since since Overlord began. So there's that, right? So anyway, so the, so these logistics guys they then have to keep up with the Great Swan is their thing. They leave wherever they are in in Normandy, and they follow the Great Swan all the way up to the up to the yep. Belgian Belgian border. But basically, you know, this echelon that that no one knows really who they are or what the point of them is. Of what they're meant to be doing, right? Because the job, there are the idea is that they will then, in, you know, be part of the relief. So there's all that, which is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and, isn't and it? The, and the and the quantities of stores involved. So R- R- Richard Adams, who was one of, um, is it Richard Adams who wrote Watership Down? Yes, it is, isn't it? He was in he was in First Airborne RESC, right? Yeah, um, and was in that seaborne tail. And there huh. were people who then then jumped into Arnhem. To be the people receiving the supplies from the supply drop element that obviously was going to, because they've got this, they've got this issue that basically supplies for when you're relieved, and then you have the supplies that are dropped in, and there's the gap between the two and how you juggle the juggle the two of them. So it's a more complicated logistic job than a standard line division necessarily it has to be. This book about the about the RESC in Arnhem is absolutely amazing. Full statistics on what they were dropping in. Yeah. So so Sten Carbine. Amazing. Sten Mark uh, Mark Five carbine, we complete with bayonet. They send they drop in eighteen of those, two one hundred and sixty two two inch mortars, fifty two three inch mortars. That's not that many. Eighty seven piots, right? Are dropped in. Guess how many? Guess how many rounds of of of, of a three hundred three bandolier are dropped in? Thousands, isn't it? One point six million rounds. Wow. And then one one point six million rounds of um, of just rifle ammo, and then eight hundred thousand rounds or eight hundred twenty three thousand seven hundred fifty six rounds of three hundred three tracer, sixteen thousand nine hundred two piot rounds. That's incredible. I mean, I, I suppose the thing that's sort of striking me is 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 two things. 
first of all, the kind of sort of, on the one hand, you've got this sort of incredibly last minute is all just been, yeah. the first Allied Airborne Army is kind yeah. of just been cobbled together and you you haven't yeah. got the time for it all to bed in. Yeah. Flip side is incredible flexibility that enables uh, um, a, a group of troops that have been for an earlier operation to suddenly be adjusted and kind of tweaked yeah. for another operation. So yeah. that, that, that's... Well, so on, one level, right. on one level, that's quite chaotic, but on another level, that's actually quite impressive well, that they, well, they can well, just yeah. change. And, and, and Lawrence Wright, who's the, who, who wrote a, a Wooden Sword, which is a, gl- a glider memoir, who's who, he's the he, he he he's from the rock end of the glider pilot regiment, but he's not interested in Chatterton. In his memoir, he says about Arnhemies, he says we just had a we would overlay logistic plans because because it was so complicated, it was so the, the glider manifest. Lo- loads and all that it's so complicated it's so much paperwork you you would not tip x out but change the change the name of the operation at the top because it's just too it's so complex so in so involved so detailed that you just had to go well sod it you know like um you know uh uh, uh this is what we'll this is what we'll do we'll just overlay the old plan i mean which is where you get the get the changes from the visual plan to the to the to market exactly. garden exactly exactly it's just exactly it's just- Exactly, comet, did you, did comet to comet like- two, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah and yeah. then to market gun. So stretchers folding airborne, one thousand two hundred seventy two stretchers go in. Sleep bags. And someone, someone's got to work that out and go. Okay, I'm going to one thousand seven hundred twenty two, yeah, yeah. not seven hundred twenty three. And we're building wastage that um, you know c- a certain amount won't get through. You know, crosses distinguishing hospital airborne thirty. You know, it, it, wow. it, workshop shelters for the Remy thirty one get dropped in. Shelter portable number 12. It's absolutely wow. amazing. Shelter portable number 12. I want to look, look up what a shelter portable number 12 <laughs> looks like. What does that look like? I don't know. And then, oh, one. And then th- this book then has tonnage of supplies collected because, of course, the thing that goes really, really wrong is the resupply because the Germans are, 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 are contesting the LZs. And, in fact, the, the LZ on, on the afternoon of the 19th the um, uh, Fourth Parachute Brigade are retreating across the LZ as um, as the drop goes in, and the glider supply, uh, the Polish gliders come in. Anyway, so um, they drop on on D plus one the eighteenth. They drop sixty six tons of uh, of stuff. Three low bulk loaded Hamel cars, thirty three Sterlings. I mean, this, uh, this is this is such big numbers uh, organised in such short time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just think about the processing of that because you, you, someone's got to decide. That's got to be approved. Then, then messages have got to go out to all the people who are going to supply it, and the battalions, and all the airfields. Well, and, the, uh, and you know, so, and, you, and then the material's got to get to the airfield, packed. Yeah, yeah. And you need a pannier that will deliver it properly, that will deliver it safely, that you that you know that you. You know, this is this is not a kind of just sort of okay. Let's go tomorrow at ten. No, kind of operation. No, No. so they uh, on on the nineteenth D plus two, they collect twenty one tons of uh, uh, supplies, which is five point four percent of the total dropped. So they they've left loads of troops there to protect that landing zone. Well, no, not, which, which no, is, which no, is, no, 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 because because what's happened on by by day three, um, th- that landing zone I- I- isn't protected anymore, and the Germans, okay, which is uh, why so little gets picked up. Yeah, when when they surrender at the bridge, they're given they're given they're given British chocolate and cigarettes, you know, by the Germans. I mean, it's oh, it's just to rub your noses in it. Yeah, it's estimated that another hundred tons approximately fell into unit lines. So, so that's the official amount connect, collected by the RASC from the LZs. And there's a there's a guy called Captain Kavanagh who on the on the nineteenth takes a bunch of lads out to try and get into the into the landing zone to collect supplies. And he's killed, um, uh, uh, and all the, all his all his lads say, "I don't know why he didn't get a gallantry medal for that because what he did was incredibly brave." Yeah. But 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 basically, what then happens as well is the rate of collection falls off because the jeeps and trailers available for collection decrease because they're completely reliant on jeeps. First Airborne is totally reliant on jeeps for bringing ammo up, radio batteries, and right. ev- evacuating casualties. And obviously, as the battle progresses, the jeeps, which are harder and harder to protect, um, because because as you know, the Oosterbeek position isn't in the Oosterbeek; it's at the edge of Oosterbeek. You know, the Shornord Hospital is on the last road on the on the what what yep. is effectively the western side of the old village. So they're essentially in the open, most of them. You know, that all the positions around 
around Div HQ, which is where they're bringing supplies into the divisional area, are exposed. They're under trees, and so the jeeps yep. and trailers are getting damaged. So even as even as the supplies keep coming, it doesn't matter because they can't transport them, and the uh, and the that tightens the the thumb screws from the supply end of things as much as anything else. And Dickie Lonsdale, after the after it, he says. If we'd had enough peer ammunition, we'd have kept them off till Christmas. But the problem is, is they can't get the peer ammunition through. And unfortunately, none of this happens on Tuesday the 19th. So I can't use it in my book, but I will use it. I'm going to be kicking it around to illustrate things. There's a a memoir by a guy called Alexander Lippmann Kessel, who was a um, a, a surgeon. And and, and in fact, who, after he died, um, insisted he was buried in the civilian cemetery in Arnhem. Um, He wanted to go back and be with, with the lads he'd he'd um uh saved Ended and what have you yeah and uh, 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 and and not saved as well and it, it his his and he's he's a dutch south he's a south african jew so he arrives in um but can speak german and he arrives in on the on the d day and then he goes to st elizabeth hospital and they set up pretty quickly and they're in there and he tries using his afrikaans to talk to the dutch people and they really don't like it because they don't like his accent, and then he tries talking German to people. Anyway, his description of running the hospital at, uh, uh, at the St. Elizabeth Hospital is absolutely amazing. You know, every now and again, you get he, he sees Urka running past the hospital window. When when Urka is running around like a great wet hen, as it's been described. He is literally right? running. Yeah, he's literally, he sees him running past the window, because the house, the, 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 the house is opposite, the house where Urka yes. ends up stranded is opposite the hospital. So he, yeah. at one point, he sees him out of the hospital window, which I think is just kind of, I, the, the more the more I push into this, the more I think I think one of the problems with the, some of the accounts of the Battle of Arnhem is they make it all too coherent. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not That's coherent. Such a good point. It's, it's not coherent it's, at all. It's no one's got a clue what the hell incoherent. is going on. No one knows what the hell's going on. And after the after the um, <laughs> least of all Roy Urquhart, least of all Roy Urquhart, and after the uh, um, you know in October. Kessel's, you know, after the battle, he, he's kept on running, working the hospital and he's tending to wounded and all the long-term wounded. And he's he's the guy that saves General Hackett's life, saves Shan Hackett's life. He's an abdo- yeah. abdominal wound. He's pierced f- in five places in his in his stomach or his guts. And Jesus. he fixes him, and and we'll come, we'll come, we'll come to the sort of the interesting thing about that. And he's in, he's in the hospital, I think, as Corporal Hater. He's had his badges yes. cut off, and the and then the Dutch underground turn up and say the Germans are coming. They think they they think they know you've got a brigadier in here, so we're coming to take him away. And they dress him up in civilian clothes, would stick a death badge on him so he can't be spoken to, and whittle him out with with Hackett going. This is a terrible idea, and cursing everyone and saying you're being ridiculous. I'm I'm not important. I'm not well enough. You know all this sort of thing. And the doctors and we're well, certainly and, not well enough. That's and Lippmann sure. Going, he's really not well enough. He shouldn't be moved. You know. Anyway, it's absolutely fascinating. So he says, you know, and every now and again, SS men will come in the building and shoot people, and then uh, in the hospital, and then really? and during the battle, and then bugger off. You know, he says from from the windows, we got glimpses of what seemed private skirmishes between small groups of the two sides. And once between cases, I happened to spot none other than the division CO, General Urquhart, with a couple of aides edging his way past some houses. So that's he probably saw. Uh, with Clemenson and Lathbury. Ridiculous. Ridiculous and incredible. He, his descriptions of working in the hospital are absolutely amazing, right? So helping, in, so he, they, they set up everything they need, right? So um, Lance Corporal Wallace, a reserved muscular Geordie from a mining village, was in charge of preparing patients and resuscitation. This, these include removal of clothing and first aid dressings, superficial cleansing the area of the wound, giving morphia and other injections from specially prepared single dose ampules, each supplied complete with its own needle taking the patient's blood pressure and, if necessary, giving plasma or rarely a whole blood transfusion. So they're set up for this. You know, we were just talking about logistics and supply. The state of the, the, the medicine that they bring with them, certainly for the first two days, which is what they're equipped for, is absolutely state-of-the-art battlefield medicine. And they've learned an awful lot from what Six Airborne have gone through, which we touched on last time. Absolutely. It, it, it's fascinating. After the battle and after the dust has settled, he then gets picked up by the German division uh, uh, medical officer, the division, division Arzt, who wants yes. them to talk about, he want, they want to pick his brains. And they know he speaks German. And he's had a couple of dealings with this guy called Skalka, who comes in to talk to him. And he thinks to himself, Skalka must know I'm Jewish. He must know. How can he look me in the face and not, and not know? You know, he's saying, I look, I look like the, the Jews they say they hate, right? So, what's going on, right? So he's then taken to um to to meet. So he must think he's toast, doesn't he? He thinks he's toast, but then kind of nothing happens, 
And he, so he thinks, well, maybe I'm all right. So Skalka says, I want you to come and meet. Come, and, We want to pick your brains. We want to ask about stuff, right? And uh, and so he gets in a car and Skalka's going, could you please hurry up? Um, uh, the, there are typhoons around and they'd like to spring surprises and all this sort of thing. And and everywhere they go, Dutch people are giving them the V sign, and other people are uh, uh, and other people are um, doing dot 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 da- have done dot 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 dash graffiti under German slogans, right? And uh, yeah. so it's you know it's all the signs of the Dutch like um, uh, uh, rebelling. Anyway, he goes for this meeting, and they start to pick his brains, right? And there's a thing called the Tobruk splint, which is a thing that was devised in the Western Desert, standard surgical procedure for the last 18 months of the British Army, right? And and he explains it to them, um, uh, the Tobruk plaster, as they call it. And he explains it to them. And they're all kind of like, yeah, yeah, we know that, whatever. Um, And the thing they want to ask him about is abdominal wounds. So they say, tell me about those men who are recovering from abdominal wounds. You've got four wounds in the belly. How many cases are there? And Kessel says, there's five. He says, yeah, but how many abdominal injuries were brought into the hospital and how many did you operate? He says, nine altogether, nine were brought in, all were operated on. I hope we'll she'll manage to save five of them. Dr. Friedrich, who's the doctor that's picking his brains, he says, yeah, but we don't get anything like that result. We, we unfortunately do not even get these results. In any case- Yeah, the, the, the abdominal wounds are considered to be fatal. Airborne surgery, they're expecting to save 60% of people with abdominal wounds, right? Yeah. The worst wound, through penicillin and surgery. Yeah, 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 and 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 surgery and proper treatment of shock, plasma, blood, um, yep. all this sort of thing. I mean, th- th- this is the most amazing conversation, right? I don't think that Kessel in, in Lippmann Kessel in his description of this is has an axe to grind because he's Jewish and he and and I don't think he's I don't think he's coming at it like that at all. I think this this is this is a real conversation. So Friedrich says we unfortunately do not even get these results. In any case, what use will these men be? Right, and then he gives them a look. He gives glances at the others. His deliberate glances at the others showed he disbelieved me. He thought he's basically thought he th- they think he's lying, cheating a line. Yeah, Friedrich continues. No doubt, it is pleasant, interesting, perhaps, to play around with such cases when you have the time. In our army, we do not believe it pays under the conditions existing at divisional level or below to trouble with severe stomach wounds. Out of every ten operated on, how many will live? Two, perhaps. At the most, three. Even those who manage to pull through are seldom of much use again. Wow! Right? And so then they're he, just discarding them. And the same goes for head injuries. He then goes on to say, only the simple casualties are worth bothering about. The ones which will live until they reach the base. Any other approach is sentimentality, not surgery. For the rest, well, in this division we have a useful occasion: Bauschus oder Kopfschuss, Spritzen, belly wound or head wound, morphia injection. That's amazing. God, that's chilling, isn't it? Yeah. So they're just basically put to death. They don't care. Put to sleep like a dog. They do not care about their men, right? And, and you know, very often when we've, when we've sort of kicked around the sort of man-for-man stuff, whatever, I know which army I'd rather be in. I'd, be the, I'd rather be in the army that if I have a stomach wound, they're trying to save my life. What are you asking of your men? To, to put themselves in danger and if they get hurt, well, bad luck. And then he says, I trusted my reply didn't show too much of the disgust I felt at their equation. Perhaps we managed to have more luck with these kinds of cases. You see, we expect something like 60% of all abdominal casualties, which reach a field surgical center to survive after operation. You know, this is the thing. And, and, and this is the thing that the, the, yep. the British and the Americans bring to them with, with their airborne things, that you, you, have a, you have a field surgical center. Does the does the does Harman's Fashmiegen landing in Sicily have that? Why is it right. the Headley Verity dies? And, and then Friedrich says, you certainly seem to employ a good deal of, of, of blood and other fluids, you know. You fool. Um, <laughs> yeah, our experience has been different. We found, for example, that to push blood into a man suffering from shock is a stupid waste of time, like beating a dead horse. We gave it up long ago, not only because it's useless, but in certain cases it can be dangerous. And so Kessel says, well, how do you treat shock? And they say they use stimulants like adrenaline and lobelin, which, which were outmoded in the British Army medical establishment in the previous war. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And you do have this, you know, it, it, it is extraordinary, isn't it, that, that you'd go into a war without putting your absolutely top men and top ideas and top backing into your medical supplies. Why wouldn't you? And, and instead, they're kind of putting them towards sort of rockets and the, the, the brains of Germany into, into rocketry and all sorts of other horrible things. But it just, it just shows that, 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 you know, because if, if, the, if, if, 
if if it is Goethe Dammering that people are after in the end in Germany at this point, you are that then you wouldn't save the bloke with the stomach wound because the world's going to end. It, it, Do you the, think that's the, come into play? I think that's part of it. I think everything's tinged with with the, the idea of destruction. And we, death. It's all it's all and fate and fate. It's that's so fatalistic, isn't it? There's no point saving them. There's no use to anybody. And 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 he goes. So they go on. The, the division, division arts asked me to give them summaries of our methods of treating the main class of injury, chest, arm, fractures, burns, and so on. At the end of each, they turned to Dr. Friedrich for his comments, which were invariably derogatory. We do the same. It's nothing new. We've tried it, but no longer believe it's worthwhile. They, they like the sulfonamides. They, they think the sulfonamides are, are a good thing, the Germans. Mm-hmm. Um, they dismiss penicillin. They dis- Skalka, the doctor that, that he's been dealing with, dismisses it as moldy cheese. Um, wow. And they say that what wow. they'll do for head wounds and stomach injuries is euthanistic morphia. He'd seen plenty of the standard of their medical care because because German casualties, having been patched up at their clearing stations, were then sent to the field surgery at, at the at St. Elizabeth Hospital because the British declared the hospital neutral or the British and the Germans agreed that it was a neutral hospital. So he'd basically then have to patch up people who'd been patched up by German field medicine because it wasn't any good. But I mean, don't forget all these guys. These guys are battling with unbelievably short supplies. Well, yes. So, so I mean, you know, maybe, maybe what you've got here in a sort of twisted way is making a virtue of a necessity that they don't have these things that the Allies have got. They don't have the sulfonamides. They don't have no penicillin. They, they, they you know, I, I imagine doing a, a blood drive in Germany is pretty difficult um, because of the sheer quantities required. You know, when you when you're running the Eastern Front, the Western Front. And you've and you're being blitzed, you know. Well, and you um, don't, and, and you know, and you you haven't diverted enough scientists to, yeah, to medical yeah. science. You, you, yeah, or yeah. the medical yeah. science you're doing is is kind of sort of weird stuff with human skin as lampshades and all this kind of crap. Yeah. And, and, well, and, this is, I mean, this is what's really interesting. So, I mean, and it's worth it's worth reading at length. This. So, um, uh, I estimated that Friedrich himself was probably an efficient technician, and that he carried out the treatment laid down by the German army's medical authorities to their satisfaction. Indeed, it was unlikely that a particularly inefficient surgeon would be appointed to one of the Reich's crack panzer divisions. The only possible conclusion was that German military surgical methods were a long way behind ours and that they had degenerated. His attitude towards blood transfusion exposed not only how Nazism had perverted medicine, but also how the system had tended, even tended to destroy itself, which is such an interesting point. Yeah. To make blood or plasma in the field means a sizable organisation, expensive in manpower and transport. The casualties who need blood are the most usually the most serious and the least likely to return to service. In short, it was worthwhile only in human terms, not strictly military ones. Friedrich's justification for rejecting it, for the use of only morphia for severe head and stomach wounds, to all of which he gave a pseudoscientific loss, was the ultimate logic in Nazi biological thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. First in the 30s had come euthanasia and racial purification in the cases of incurable mental disease. Next, liquidation of non-Aryan elements. Finally, the systemized, systematized refusal to attempt to save the lives of troopers in the 96 SS Panzer Division, the noblest flower of Aryan youth. Wow. 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 Isn't that it's so thought-provoking? Yeah, I'm sure you can get some of that in on the 19th, though. Oh, well, I'm going to, because I'm going to talk about medicine's going to be, because what's really interesting is also when you read the officers' accounts, they're trying to, what they're trying to do is put their chaps on maps and they're trying to deliver you the arrows on the map and say, I had an O group and we agreed to do this, that, and the other, and the map reference, right? And you know also that half of their troops, they don't know where they are because they're in all hiding in houses. You know, Tony Dean Drummond, who's the signals chief, he ends up hiding in a toilet for three days with with other blokes, you know, with the smell of shit. They, they don't know where they are, but they think they know where they are, um, and they don't know where anyone else is. And so his account is sort of honest in that he, he doesn't know what's going on. I mean, you've made such a good point about, about, you know, one of the problems of accounts is that they're too ordered. The medic we were talking about last time, Stuart, Stuart Mawson, and someone else pointed this out that, that there was uh, uh, when I was talking when we were talking about it on Twitter. They pointed out it's one of their favourite accounts of the battle because he's not writing about it as a soldier. He's a he's a doctor, so he's writing about it as, basically as an amateur witness. So when when the men when the men in eleven power are like escaping the mortar barrage that catches them in the open, he he describes them as looking like animals fleeing a forest fire. And you think, right? That's a, that's that's a, that's a very vivid description. I'm, I'm, I'm getting that. I'll, that's I'll chaos. Have that. I'll have that. That's chaos, rather than you know t- 
tactically, it was uh, 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 not not to the best of our advantage to withdraw in this situation, engaging with the enemy. You know, like you know, you know what I mean. And I think, and some of the glider pilots as well, because because they had varying degrees of uh, of, of infantry training. You know, the way they describe things in some of their accounts is more is more like that, where they're going. Yeah, they're, they're they're not they're not trying to sort of. Uh, compartmentalize it into military speak. But one of the one of the things that's really, really, th- th- and this is the last thing for the Kessel thing that's really fascinating. They, I mean, one of the things they keep doing is they keep doing mock burials of people out of the out of the out of the hospital, um, which okay. are basically weapons. So they're burying weapons. Um, oh, I visit. see. Right. Okay. Yeah, and then every now and again they'll they'll carry someone out on a stretcher who's fine and and, and uh, under a blanket, and then he'll run off. So they're doing that sort of stuff. Wow, okay, yeah. that's quite interesting. But they have a radio. They find a radio, um, and uh, uh, it, with with this a uh, wi- little army a uh, military ra- radio receiver, wireless receiver, and the padre and the and the and Kessel, like Lippman Kessel, they hide it in a toilet, and then they listen to it from time to time. Each evening they go out with a torch, paper, and pencil, and they tune in, tune in for the nine o'clock news. They one would dictate, and the other would write down, right? And one night in October, they hear General Urquhart, the expedition's commander, then back in London, give a full summary of the battle, from which we were able for the first time to understand a little of what had happened. He didn't know no what had happened. No idea. He, they, he says, we still believed that Second Army would attack across the Rhine at any minute and kidded ourselves with fanciful excuses for the lack of hard news. And the thing that makes him know that in the end that's not going to happen is when the RAF destroy Arnhem Bridge so the Germans can't use it. Wow. That irked account of him yes. going, well, the chaps did awfully well and, uh, and then there was a, it was a, they added a bit thin when a tank got in amongst them and all that, right? In which you can hear he's... And he's, it's all very stiff upper lip, but you can hear him. You can hear he's in completely in bits, I think. Um, and so right, to, now come a, to now come across someone who heard it when it went out in his account and say, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I found out so, some of what had happened in the battle, which I just think is amazing. Because he's a surgeon, it? so he's not thinking militarily, he's just dealing no. with the casualties. And he says, and Is this a book or is this in the. It's, in a, the it's a book. It's a book. It's a book. It's a book, uh, and it's it's on it's it's. I Never think heard Penn's, of it. I think Pen and Sword published Surgeon at Arms, parachuting into Arnhem with the first airborne. Then he escapes, you know, and he's part of the sort of one of those escape things where they're all like they're hiding in barns and. Uh, trying and he gets to get back away. to our lines. Mm. Wow! Yeah. A surgeon a learns soon. A surgeon learns soon, perhaps too soon, to isolate himself from the human agony, to free his professional judgment from the fetters of pity. This is something different from being hard. But in a cauldron like Arnhem, Arnhem, there is too much pain, too much torn muscle and splintered bone, too much insult to young bodies. Wow, what a line! Well, it sounds to me like you're getting absolutely amazing material. There's some, there is some great, there is some and, really, and, really... And, and changing perspectives and things quite a lot. I well, well, I think the thing, the want. thing I want, the thing I really want to try and get hold of. They all thought it, they they were all desperate to go, and there's you know th- th- there's. There's that thing of the, the, a so big no, part no lambs of slaughter nonsense. No, and a big no, and a big part of why people said yes to it, even though they kind of thought, you know, um, lot some people thought the landing zones were, were, were an ideal, drop zones were an ideal. Other people thought, brilliant, we will land and arrive in strength. Yeah, great. And they're also in the questionnaire. The the, the the questionnaire. They're all asked about how they feel about dropping at daylight, and they're all going brilliant. Bring it on. <laughs> I I hate it dropping at night. But the training jumps I did at night was terrifying. Yeah, fantastic. And then the other guys who go, I've never, I've never fought before. In the, I had never fought in battle before, so I was entirely content with going in at daylight. So I'd know what was going on. Amazing. Yeah, and and, and the thing. So that's the thing I want to try and capture. So by the Tuesday, they're still thinking we can do this, even though the Monday has been an absolute disaster. Yeah, and, and the other you, good thing, the other good thing about, about all these um, um, Cornelius Ryan stuff is this is all happening in the sixties. So it's, yeah, it's really yeah. so not it's all, that long after. It's all fresher, and it's also be- be- actually it's also before a bridge too far. Yes, of course. It's before their memories have kind of been got at. Yeah, by the historiography, which is you know after we we, we ages ago we had that we had that letter, didn't we? John Howard writing to um yes 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 uh, to, uh, to love it. 
to love it going, unfortunately, the men have all seen the film and their memories have been tainted. Yeah. And, and so th- this is all before A Bridge Too Far is A Bridge Too Far. So none of them have, none of them have seen A Bridge Too Far. So, there is, so for instance, there is, a, there is a mention of one of the supplies things, the second line supplies, there were berets and that annoyed us. But it, it not, it's not blown up into a dramatic instant directed no, and of course, and of course, this is movie. this is not only just before the film. This is before the book. I mean, exactly, it's exactly my point. So, and the book comes quite substantially before the film. So, yeah. Well, anyway, how interesting! Great yeah, stuff. Uh, but, it, but it's finding that the medics are the place that I'm, and the, the medics are the thing that I'm finding really, really because they're writing about it quite. They're writing about it quite differently, they're, and they're also they're also demonstrating, you know, how state of the art this thing is. But then to loop all the way back round to what we were talking about earlier, that without artillery firepower. The allied way of doing things is, doesn't work. Doesn't work, you know, because what the they thing really that saves, need is piets. <laughs> but the th- yeah, piet, piet ammo. That's amazing. Yeah. Right. Well, that there we go. So I'm I'm scrabbling around in that stuff and trying to make sense of Sounds it. Great to, Sounds great yeah, fun. Sounds great. Yeah, it is really really interesting. Well, but no, because clearly you're finding out new material and you've been looking yeah. at the subject for a long time and finally you're getting new stuff and there's there's nothing more exciting. If you uh, if you fancy it, there is our Patreon. Um, we uh, we're we're. Not one of those hard sell podcasts. You know, Jim, I noticed there have been a load of podcast awards ceremonies this week, and at no point have we ever told any of our listeners to vote for us in any kind of nomination thing. We've never yeah, why don't we it. know about that? I don't know. Oh, don't we don't need that kind of stuff. We're, we're above awards. You know, that's like sort of, you know, hunting for a night's cross. <laughs> I'm going to win a bloody VC. I'll let my actions the do the talking. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. We will see you again very, very soon. The live cast... Um, wasn't last night. Um, th- this is Tuesday. It's next Monday. If you're a Patreon, where you you can watch me and Jim uh, engage in this sort of deathless banter. Um, we, <laughs> <laughs> you lucky um, people. Uh, you lucky people. That's Patreon. We have ways. Um, if you pa- if you Google, we have ways of making you talk Patreon. You will find it easily enough. Um, we will see you all very soon. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Cheerio. 